throw a very obscure switch, SEE docs. Crew didn't understand what we wanted, repeated over and over and over, and finally Al Bean caught on through the proper switch. Telemetry came back online, the team could get to work. We verified reactants were flowing into the fuel cells. We brought the fuel cells back online in the power system. We secured the navigation system. Everything kept working, got the crew up in orbit. We delayed injection uh, to the moon by one rev that day so we could check the spacecraft out as thoroughly as possible. And then a very gutsy move with Apollo 12, we decided we'd go to the moon. So by the time we got to Apollo 13, this was our third lunar landing mission. Previous two missions had been pretty sporty and we were hoping this mission would go a lot smoother for us. Crewmen were Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Ken Mattingly. Lovell and Hayes were the crew in the lunar module and they were scheduled to descend the very rugged landing site on the moon that we called Frau Marrow. Uh, Ken Mattingly was the command module pilot. He'd remained circling the moon in the mothership. About three days prior to launch, we had been scrubbed from the mission because he had been exposed to measles and was replaced by Jack Swigert, a member of the backup crew. Now, missions run in trust. When you turn seven and a half million pounds of thrust loose with Saturn V, that's commitment. There is no change in your mind, no turning back from that decision. And trust allows you to make the split-second decisions very rapidly, seek out every option that may exist. We lost an engine during the second stage of power flight. We looked at the remaining four engines, they were all go. We computed the new engine shutdown time, verified we had enough propellant to get the crew up in orbit, passed this information up to the crew, everything, everything kept working, got them up in orbit, checked the spacecraft out, and two and a half hours later, we give the crew the go for translunar injection. So now by the end of the second day, this crew is 200,000 mi 200, miles from Earth, uh, 50,000 miles from the surface of the moon. And we're entering a phase of the mission, we use the term, entering the lunar sphere of influence. And this is the point in the mission where you cross over from near gravity to the moon's, gra moon's gravity. And for about a short period of time of four hours, you have two mission aboard options. One comes around the front side of the moon, takes a day and a half to return to Earth. The other one goes completely around the moon, takes between four and five days to get back home. Got to make up your mind quick because time on these options is running out. My team was on the console. We were just finishing our second shift. Everything was looking pretty good. During the shift, we had had a television broadcast from the crew. And during the broadcast, the crew's wives and families had been sitting behind me in the viewing room. When we secured the television link, families went home. And now in my main control room, the noise level was building up because the next team of controllers had reported in for shift handoff work. Their flight director was Glenn Lunny. He was the leader of the black team. We used colors to identify teams in those days. He was sitting next to me at the console reading my log. Final thing my team had to do was to put the crew to sleep. We have a five-page pre-sleep checklist we go through very carefully to make sure everything's properly configured before we give the go for start of the sleep. We got down to the final entry, and the final entry asks a question. Do we require a cryo stir? Now, the fuels on board the spacecraft are cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen. Super dense, super cold, liquid packed in vacuum insulated tanks at incredibly low temperatures of minus 300, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Cryogenics react with the catalyst in the fuel cell to produce electricity, and as a byproduct, they produce heat and pure water. So this is the energy, heat, and water resource we need to go to the moon, operate in the vicinity of the moon, and then return to Earth. So they're enormously important. Two days into the mission, however, I've used some of these cryogenics, and if I could look inside the tank right now, I would see a two-phase condition, part liquid, part gas. And in this condition, it's very difficult to manage the inlet pressures to the fuel cells because within the same tank, there are different, different areas of vari the pressure varies throughout the tank. So the designers put fans inside the tank. They would turn on to stir this mixture up, and we had a heater that we used to raise the pressure. That's what a cryo stir was all about. Jack Swigert in the command module acknowledged our request for the stir, and he looked behind him and coming through the tunnel from the lunar module was Fred Hayes. Swigert then threw two switches. Nothing happened for 16 seconds. And then inside the oxygen tank to a spark jump between the fan and the heater assembly, and the pressure in that tank rises very rapidly over the next six seconds until it blows the dome of the tank off. When the dome came off, the insulation surrounding the tank caught fire, and fed by the oxygen, it was, oxygen, it was like a blowtorch. 
racing through the bay of the spacecraft, carrying out the instrumentation and the plumbing and the electrical system, shocking valves closed until the pressure increased to the point where it blew the side of the spacecraft off. When the side came off the spacecraft, the area surrounding it was enveloped in a cloud of debris from an explosion and frozen particles of oxygen. Now, we did not know an explosion had occurred. It's 55 hours, 55 minutes, and four seconds from launch. My voice loops come alive. Hey, flight, we've had a computer restart. Now the controller calls off. Main bus interval. Third one says antenna switch. Then down from the spacecraft level calls. Hey, Houston, we got a problem. But well, I already had a bunch of problems reported, and I was wondering which one he was talking about. The controllers at that instant didn't know what to believe because none of their data made sense. The crew thought they had been hit by a meteor. And for about 60 seconds, the communications loops are literally chaotic with all the reports coming in. And then the training kicked in. The controllers started working the problem. We started voicing instructions up to restore some of the lost function. So by three minutes, we're into the process of recovery. But all the problems that remain fall upon a single controller by the name of Cy Lieberguts. And Psy has the system's responsibility for those things you need to stay alive in space, power, oxygen, pressure, heat, water. But I can't work with Psy because the tumbling motion of the spacecraft has momentarily overcome Lovell's ability to control it. Now we're driving towards a condition we call gimbal lock. If this occurs, we're going to tumble our gyros. We'll lose our ability to point the spacecraft, communicate, perform maneuvers, find our way back to Earth. If we get into gimbal lock condition, we're literally going to be lost in space until we can go through the complex and time-consuming process of reorienting a navigation system. So we must avoid it at all costs. And you're becoming increasingly desperate. You're working the blind, and you still don't have a clue what's happened. Plus 20 minutes. Lovell's looking outside the hatch when he says, hey, Houston, I see some kind of a gaseous substance. I believe we are venting our oxygen. All of a sudden, the pieces fit together. There had been an explosion on board the spacecraft with an enormous amount of collateral damage. When I debriefed my controllers after the mission, they described their feeling at that instant as if they were just tumbling into a void. I was a fighter pilot. Fighter pilots in my day used the term looking into the eyes of a tiger. And this is the stark and the very lonely feeling that you get when the only thought on your mind is survival, and you're trying to find some way out of the box you're in. Well, I was a flight vector, and my job to get going, so I call the flight controllers up and say, okay, flight controllers, settle down. Quit your guessing, and let's start working this problem. Electrical bus say is still good. Don't do anything to screw it up. The lunar module's attached. We're going to use that as our lifeboat. Now get me some backup people here and get me more computing and communications resources. Plus 30 minutes. My boss, Chris Kraft, comes in. Just as we're starting a series of emergency power downs, we're trying to buy some time. And the neighbor got comes to me, and he says, Flight, I'd like to shut down fuel cells one and three. I say, Sire, we better think about that. And he says, no flight, I think that's the only way we're going to stop these leaks. I say, Sire, are you ready for your final option? He says, yeah, flight, it's time. Well, I have three fuel cells on board the spacecraft that use these cryogenics to produce all the resources we need to fly. But the problem was, once they're shut down, they could never be restarted. Very reluctantly, I agree with Sire that it's time to shut down two of the fuel cells. So we always see instructions up to Jim Lovell. And the discussion with Jim is very short, very intense, and very reluctantly, Jim proceeds to shut down two of the fuel cells. This is probably the lowest point in morale in the entire mission, because now we know there's no more going to the moon. We also know it's going to be tough, maybe impossible, to get this crew home. Not through decisions yet, because you have to pick the return path. If I jump